Good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible. You can turn uh, to the book of Matthew. We'll be there in a moment. You can see through this series, we're walking through a series in the book of Matthew where we're looking at the highlights really along the way that point to Jesus as king. Trying to get our minds and our hearts around what it means for him to be king. And of course, king has a kingdom. And so we've been focusing throughout these weeks and all the way to the end of June. We're going to be walking through the book of Matthew. Recently, my son, and uh, Travis, and I went to a movie that, together. That's kind of our thing. We're running a little bit late, but we weren't too concerned because there's about 25, 30 minutes of previews, right, of upcoming attractions. So we got there. Of course, you know, the, it's all designed for you to go, ooh, you know, the trailer of the movie. Oh, my God, i got to see that one. Generally, <clears throat> Travis reminded me of this. When he was younger, I'd take my kids to a movie, and we'd watch a preview, and when it was done, I couldn't help myself. I'd go, nope. And then we'd move on. They watch the next one. Mm -mm, nope. And uh, and dad, stop! And doing the embarrassing dad thing. Um, but every now and then there'll be a preview or a coming attraction, and you go, "Yes, I got to see that. I got to see more of that." They're showing you the best parts of it, right? And 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 you know what's what we're going to do today? We're going to look at at a, a coming attraction today. You've come on the right day if you need encouragement today, and we all need encouragement, whatever you're walking through in your life. God knows that through tough times, we lose perspective, don't we? And then by his grace, he gives us a new perspective, and then we gain perspective in order to live for his glory, a word you're going to hear a lot uh, today. Before we get to Matthew 17, I'm going to place it in context because it's really important in this passage or it really won't make a lot of sense. Uh, we started in the book of Matthew with the genealogy where Matthew is writing to Jews primarily and he's saying, I want you to see from the start, Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the liberating king is what Messiah literally means. Christ is the word that, that we see in, in, that we translate from the Greek, Christos. Messiah in, in Hebrew. He's the one. So we looked at the genealogy, then his coronation as the king which is his baptism. Right after that, the temptations, where we see a microcosm, a look into his entire life and ministry, what it's gonna be like, fighting up against evil and darkness in the world and overcoming evil. Of course, we know now he gives us his spirit to do the same. As the book of Matthew continues on, uh, the disciples are following, getting a, a clearer picture along the way, but mostly they really don't understand What's happening? We noted last week, John the Baptist thought the Messiah was going to be different. He's going to be a kind of a political leader, maybe a military leader. He's going to come with force and then uh, allow the Israelites to come out of this Roman occupation. And, and John from prison, his circumstances have changed. And though he thought he was clear, he's now sending word to Jesus asking the question, are you the one? Really? Because when our circumstances change, we lose perspective, don't we? Or when we have new understanding of who Jesus is, it could change our perspective for the better. Or we turn away and say, I don't think I'm in for this. This is not what I signed up for. Well, as we get to the latter part of Matthew 16 in particular, Peter now has announced, he's proclaimed that you are the Messiah. Jesus says, who do you guys say I am? There's a lot of talk about who I am. And, and, and some say Elijah, some say others, one of the prophets who do you say? And, and you remember Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah, the liberating king. And Jesus says, yes, you got it. And on that proclamation, that truth that you just proclaimed on who I am, I'm going to build my church on that truth. And then at the latter part of, of Matthew 16, Jesus starts to shift. He starts to turn uh, towards a more, it's more ominous, kind of foreboding message, it seems. He starts to talk about his death upcoming. He starts to talk about his suffering. And then Peter, at that point, says, no way. That is not happening. And do you remember Jesus' response to him? What do he call it? Get behind me, Satan. What? I mean, you talk about a rebuke, right? He's saying, listen, for you to try to stand in the way of what my entire purpose here is, is satanic. And then he starts to talk about his suffering. He's going to suffer at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's going he's to die. 
He starts to talk about his death. And, the, and the, these, now these disciples are so troubled by all of this. And who wouldn't have been? They place all their hopes in Jesus. Now he's talking about suffering and he turns to them and says, and you're going to die to yourself as well. You're going to die daily. You're going to take up your own cross. And I'm just guessing. Maybe you've come to points in your life like this, like I have. I remember I came to Christ as a child, not unlike several of the children that we saw baptized today. And then it was later in my, my high school years when I realized, oh my gosh. He's calling me actually to die to myself every single day. He's calling me to live for him, not just to beam me up to heaven someday, but actually to live, to die daily, even if it means suffering for him. I remember then, uh, that's, I don't know if that's what I signed up for. It can be troubling. This is where the disciples are. In fact, at the last part of, of chapter 16, it says this in verse 28. You can see it there. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, this could mean a lot of things. Some believe it means uh, he's going to continue on in his ministry. It's about six months before the, the, the crucifixion. Some believe it's um, the resurrection. Some commentators think it's Acts 2 when the, when the Spirit comes. I tend to think, along with other uh, commentators, that he's actually talking about what comes next in such close proximity In the book of Mark, the book of Luke, we see it in Luke 9, Mark 9, the same story in all the synoptic gospels. We see the same story hinge right here and he goes straight now to uh, chapter 17. I believe he's saying it's it's coming. And what we're seeing here, and I wanna wanna frame it this way. I want you to think with me to apply this message today. Uh, they, They are bewildered. They're wondering what is going on. You ever feel like that? I know there are times when I do. I wonder, Lord, what? Are you really? I know you're in control, but I just don't see it. Uh, how are there, why are there wars in the world? Why is there such evil? Why do we struggle, even in our own Christian lives? Why is it so hard? Sometimes that causes us to lose perspective and we start to lose our faith. Our circumstances shift and we struggle to really believe. If we were honest today, All of us struggle at times. Maybe you're walking through some of the darkest, most difficult times in your life right now. And it's causing you to question. We often doubt. And it's times like that when God is so gracious as he does here with the disciples, he gives us a new perspective. But first, I want us to focus on how we lose perspective. Really the first point in this message. We we lose perspective. Look at verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. You know, these are his closest kind of core group, his brother, James and John, brothers, and led him, led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, here's what's happening. We're about to see what's called the transfiguration. Now, this is one of the key moments, highlight moments in the life of Jesus. If you were to really mark those highlight moments, you could say, well, the incarnation, certainly. Uh, There's the baptism we've looked at. The transfiguration. And then you could say, well, the crucifixion, resurrection. Those are the high points. Here is one of the most significant moments in the life of Jesus. And if you're like me, having read it through many years, you look at this story and go, I don't know what just happened. I don't know. I don't understand. Today we're going to get our minds around it because this is a picture of an upcoming attraction. What you're about to see is, is designed to encourage you today we lose perspective and we often like the disciples we hear challenging news or we we, we're troubled by all that's happening we need encouragement and so Jesus so gracious meets us where we are and he said hey come with me come with me we have to position ourselves at times obey him to follow him to sit with him He says, come with me. He calls him up. What I believe is Mount Hermon. There's some debate about this as well. It's right next to Caesarea Philippi, about 9,400 feet up. You may not know this, but in Israel, uh, there's a mountain that you can see about four, four months out of the year. And it is snow all over the mountain. In fact, I went to a website. There's snow on the mountain right now. And I believe they went up Mount Hermon. I don't know. They went all the way up to the top, but in fact, this mountain is so high, uh, There's a ski resort on this mountain. Do you know that's in Israel? I'd love to go there. Just get a t-shirt, 
ski Israel. I just think that'd be really cool. Um, but there's this, there's a ski resort. And, and so they, they're going up, I'm guessing somewhere on the slope here, he takes them up to a higher place. Okay. A mountaintop. You think about Moses or Elijah, others who've encountered God on the mountaintop. So it's often the case. And here it says in, in uh, verse two, um, and we don't know the exact location because it doesn't matter. How do I know that? Because it's not here. We don't know. But in verse two, he says, and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. So, I mean, almost just rather abruptly and he was transfigured. You know, wait, 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 what? What is happening here? What did they see? Well, they saw something they couldn't quite explain is what we realized. Doesn't go into great detail here. We know this, uh, the word in the Greek is metamorpho. You know the word metamorphosis, right? You might remember, what do you think of? Metamorphosis, we go back to, to grade school or somewhere in middle school. It, it's, it's the caterpillar to the butterfly, right? The disciples are gonna watch. The caterpillar transforms into a butterfly right in front of them. And by the way, I don't know this, caterpillar to butterfly. That is a literally a chemical change at the very core of what this creature is. Here, Jesus doesn't change at the core of who he is, but instead we see him transformed, okay? He is transformed. This same word, metamorpho, we find it in uh, Romans 12, verse two. You might know this verse. See if you do. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed, metamorpho, by the what? Renewing of your mind so that you may do the will of the Father, bring glory to him. We're being transformed, metamorphosed, and changed from the inside out. John Calvin called this event a temporary exhibition of his glory. What's happening here is this is, this is like resurrection out of time. The future shows up in the present. And the disciples see Jesus as he is, like as he really looks. They see him, even as we will see him someday glorified. Jesus is transfigured, but it defies language. Sometimes you see something so beautiful. Has that happened to you before? I remember stepping out through some trees, seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time, and it literally took my breath away. I, did, I had never experienced that before. <sighs> wow. And you, there, it's, it, there's no words for what you see. And that's what we're seeing here. Our Scottish friends say it this way, it's better felt than telt. You just take it in. Just take it in. You can't really describe it, it's so beautiful. His divinity is veiled in his humanity, but here for a moment, his divinity is displayed, his glory, glory, an expression of his character, of his holiness is seen. Now you might know that Isaiah uh, tells us that that there was nothing about him. He was not one that we were attracted to. In other words, Jesus was just, looked like a normal person. We often wonder, what did he look like? Well, he looked like a Middle Eastern person is what he looks like. But we wouldn't have picked him out in a crowd unless he was maybe doing you know, some kind of miracle. Now, art doesn't serve us so well here. You know, he's got a halo or he's there, he's shining a little bit and everybody's all around him. But in a crowd, unless he's teaching, you would not have known there's the Messiah. There he is over there. But here, they're seeing something very different. His beautiful dark skin is turned white. Not with leprosy, which would have been the case. But in fact, it's not as much white as it's shining light. Light, you know, I mean, it says more, more than a color. He, he's, he, he's expressing his, his purity. There's no stain. There's no sin in him. And so uh, I could say it this way. He, he became what he was not, okay, a man, without ceasing to be who he was, God. But his divinity was veiled in his humanity. But here we see a preview of a coming attraction. You know, I, I wonder, if you could see the future, surely you've thought about this. If you could know the future, how would that change your life? Stacey and I recently, not too long ago, we watched a basketball game um, of a team and, we, we, and we, knew that, we knew that our team had won. We thought, well, let's watch it. That'd be fun. 
They already won. Let's watch it. So we were watching the game. And you can imagine then, right? Already know who wins changes everything about how you watch the game. I mean, there'd be lead changes, real close game. Oh my goodness, that player's out. Oh no, he fouled out. Oh my goodness, we're down by five. Surely, we're not doing that. We're going, meh. We win. We're winning. That's a horrible call. What is the ref thinking? There's no way we're going to... No, no. We win. Completely changes how you see everything that's happening because it's not just optimism. It's a realized optimism. It's already happened. Yet we're watching it play out. Friends, this is the Christian life. You know, uh, Travis and Kim Cook are, are doing a special study in our Sunday seminary. They're talking about the millennium today. We're pro-millennial is what I am. I always tell people. Pre-millennial, ah-millennial, post-millennial. I'm pro-millennial. I'm for it. Let's go. Let, let's get on with this. Let's do this. I'm for it because we win, right? It's the person, they, they, they ask some guy, do you really understand Revelation? And the guy said, yeah, in two words, we win. We win. If you're on his side, we win. How would it change your life this week if you could live with a realized optimism? That's what this is about. Jesus is so gracious, he gives these disciples and us the final score. Here's where we're heading, and here's where you are heading. The Bible says when we see him face to face, we're transformed to be just like him. Even now, he's transforming us to become just like him. Mark says his clothes are whiter than any laundry cleaning could ever make them. Because he's shining, it's whiter than white. This is shining brightly. The disciples catch a glimpse. This transfiguration is, is time out of order. They see the resurrection out of order. And this glory is fully seen by the disciples. Jesus is seen. And, and again, his, his, his skin just shining. You might remember when Moses saw God on the mountain, he came with his backside, you know, interesting for us again, kind of accommodating so we can understand what this is about. I mean, it's on his backside, but even Moses came with his, his face shining, but it's reflective. Jesus is the source. God is the source of light. And that's what's happening here. And so it says in verse three, and behold, there appeared to them, Moses and Elijah talking with him. Suddenly the four become six, James, John, and Peter see Moses and Elijah. Again, how strange is this? What are they talking about? Wouldn't that be cool? What are they talking about? Luke tells us, Luke 9, 31, they were talking about his departure. Literally, his exodus is the word. They were talking about the new exodus. And so these two who represent the law and the prophets, a way to describe all the redemptive history by two men, representing the law and the prophets, and Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. That's what's happening here. We know a lot more than the disciples knew at this time. They're wrestling with what is this all about. Jesus is above it all. He's the fulfillment of it all. You might remember when Philip invited his friend Nathaniel to come and meet Jesus. Come and see. He says in John chapter 1, verse 25, he refers to the whole of Hebrew, Hebrew scripture in this twofold division. This is what he says. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets also wrote about Jesus of Nazareth. He said, we found him. And that's what they're experiencing here. Philip was right. All of scripture has a common theme. It's one big book that points to Jesus. All the stories, everything in it. Jesus is at the front. He's at the end and he's in the middle and throughout Alistair Begg put it this way. I love this quote. The new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed. He's been there all along. And now the old understood, revealed in Jesus. That's what's happening here. This wonder, wonderful interface of old and new, the entire story of redemption with these three. And then look at what happens in verse four. It says they're talking about his 
his suffering, his crucifixion. They're talking about his exit. They're talking about, the, I'm guessing they're talking about the resurrection. And then in verse four, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. He's like, I like, this is awesome. If you wish, I, I will make three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Peter, who always had a bias towards action, says, oh, let's build something. Like we could build a monument here. Let's build a retreat center. It'll be really cool. He, you know, he's as if to say, hey, what you were talking about earlier, like right before this, the suffering, the dying, no, 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 no. no. But this, now this is good. This right here is amazing. Let's stay right here. He, he, he wants to, to build something. I love what Mark says. Mark tells the reader, I, I kind of chuckle around this, Peter, who often spoke before he was thinking very much, but it never kept him from saying something, right? Mark actually says, actually tells the reader, he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> he was terrified. And Mark adds parenthetically, throwing shade at Peter. He, he didn't know what he was saying. He was like, we gotta do something. And, and let me pause here for just a moment because I want you to notice something. They just, just parenthetically, just to encourage you here. Notice they are themselves. They know it's Elijah and Moses. Now, I, I wondered how, they didn't have name tags on. Like, how did they know? Maybe from what they heard. We're gonna, we're gonna see Jesus walking with them down the mountain afterwards, maybe explaining what was happening, but they, they knew. There's something about our identity in the future. Listen, when you die, you don't change your identity. You don't become an angel. Angels are angels. They're messengers. They're created beings as well. We're human and forever you will be yourself. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh man, bummer. I'm going to be me all my life. No, you're going to be a new, improved you. Perfect indestructible body that will never die. You will be without sin. People ask me, Jeff, will we know each other on the new earth and in and, and, and the new heaven and, and eternity? Yes, we're gonna know each other. We'll be known and fully known and fully loved. And, and, and the Bible tells us that we're gonna know each other. We're gonna have a relationship with one another as it's always meant to be, to be fully known. And yet still fully loved. It's beautiful. Look at verse uh, five. He was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Where have we heard that before? Anybody? It's baptism. Exactly. In fact, three times God speaks audibly in the New Testament. Each time about his beloved son. Now they see this cloud coming up. I find it, I find it interesting. It says, while wow, he was still speaking. <laughs> Peter's in mid-sentence. And God says, okay, shut up. All right, stop talking. Listen to him. Look at him. Listen to him. Stop talking. And they're overcome by a cloud on the mountain. Moses, Elijah, God showing up already present in Jesus. Now the father speaks. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. God completely interrupts this. And he says, stop talking, listen to him. You see, the disciples, they needed a new perspective. They had lost perspective. They needed to be encouraged because the next six months, they're gonna go through the hardest time of their lives. Friends, you need to be encouraged today. We don't know what's coming, but we know it's going to be tough. I asked one of our senior adults this morning, how are you doing? They said, well, better. I'm better. But you know, the truth is this. These disciples following Jesus, they're going to, they're going to watch him suffer and die on a cross as a criminal. Each one of them will die martyr's deaths. Minus John, who ends up on the Isle of Patmos in exile. Judas, of course, hangs himself. You can say, it doesn't go so well for him. No, 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 no. Listen, sometimes when you decide to follow after Jesus, listen, you might die. Literally. And we need to teach our kids this, by the way. Not to scare them. 
but to say this is what it takes. And these disciples needed to be encouraged. They got this coming attraction to say, this is where all of history is heading. This is it. So listen, when you lose perspective, where do you go? Honestly, before God, what what do you do? Maybe you talk to a trusted friend, a spouse, or maybe you read a book. Maybe you, people ask me, Jeff, how do I hear from God? Especially when I'm struggling. I don't even really want to pray. And I don't always, I have a hard time hearing. How do I hear from God? Listen, there's a book for that. There's a book for that. Are you in his word? Do you read his word every day? I've said it this way, friends. Let me just, just pause for a moment. We're Christians, right? Most of us here, I'm assuming, are Christians. At some point, you're going to have to read the Bible. At some point, you're going to have to decide, I want to know everything that's in this book. At some point, as Christians, we've got to say, this is the word of God. This is where I hear from him. Yes, he speaks to us by his spirit, through others, through a preacher, even proclaiming the word of God. He speaks to you daily in his word. Are you in it? Do you want to know it? Do you want to apply it? It's why we go to great lengths. It's why Megan Hendrickson helps me, our, our, our teaching pastors. She's one of us, one of them, where she writes every week, helps us to understand and get underneath this passage. We work together as a team to say, we want you to, uh, to know God's word. It's why we have connect groups. If you're not in one, you need to be in one. If you're not a member of this church, join this church. Because you will be under the spiritual authority of others who can help you hear from God. We lose perspective, but we hear from him as we know his word. So first, we lose perspective. Watch this. God gives perspective. I love this. And I'll I'll head through these last couple of points really quickly. They needed a new perspective. And so he gives them a new perspective. Listen, our, our worship services every week are designed for you to regain your perspective, to see the glory of God in a moment like this, for you to leave and say, you know what? I lost my perspective, but God has given me a new perspective today. That's why every week our gatherings are so critical. Look at what happens in verse seven. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Matthew offers this word as emphasis. They saw no one but Jesus. Only. Only Jesus is there. This is the Christian life. And this is what we need to see today. This is what I want you to hold on to as we go through this week. And Jesus says, we're not staying here. That's a good idea, Peter. Thank you. But no, we're going to go down the mountain. We got work to do. We don't, live in the, we don't live up in the mountaintop. We live in the valley. Look at verse nine. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one of this vision not until, until the son of man is raised from the dead. He says, people aren't ready for this. But after the resurrection, they'll know. They'll know what this is. You guys will know too. More fully what you understand here, you're gonna understand more so later. Verse 10, it says, and the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? This sounds like a non sequitur, but they're putting it together now. He answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. Elijah's coming and when he does, the Messiah is right behind him. Last week, friends, I met a guest who came to our church for the first time. Her name is Jessica. I don't know if she's in here right now, but last week I met her. One of our, one of our members, like all of us do and should do, saw this woman walking in, first time ever here. Maybe she... Just, she's being kind and loving. Just went up and said, hey, are, are you new? Can I help you? And she said, come sit with me. Well, then we learned, I entered, and then she introduced me to Jessica, who was uh, formerly a Jew. And she was in New York City just a, even like a month ago. She just moved to Dallas. A friend of hers going through a really hard time, someone told her to read the book of Luke. She read the book of Luke and she came to Christ and received him as her savior and Lord. By reading the book of Luke. 
She said, oh, I, I was like, that's amazing. She said, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I said, that's incredible. You're a completed Jew. That's amazing. She goes, I love Jesus. I don't know what that is, but I love Jesus. I said, no, a completed Jew means that you, you now understand he's the long awaited Messiah. He's the one. I could have said that the law and prophets point to. And she's like, yes, I love Jesus. Friends, let me ask you, do you today, do you believe Do you believe? Do you believe that, yes, John the Baptist, Elijah has come. Do you believe that when we lose perspective, then God gives perspective, and watch this, then we gain perspective. By his grace, he reveals himself to us and he shows himself even today. And I just want to close by reminding you of this. Jesus touches them. He's touched your heart today. And then he says, rise and have no fear. And when they lift up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. You know, in art, we learn of um, one perspective drawings. There are different perspectives in art. But one is you see a lot in photographs or in artwork of painting. One perspective means everything in the painting goes to one point. Right, it's you can see it like a, a road, like a landscape, or you see it with like a railroad tracks, right, or a building. Everything goes to a singular perspective. What happens in life, like the disciples, we lose perspective, and we forget that it all focuses in on Jesus Christ, our Savior. Everything we do here is about Him. We're all about Jesus, because when we focus on Him, everything else in life makes sense. When you lose perspective, God, by his grace, gives it if we'll position ourselves to be in close proximity with him in his word, then we gain perspective in order to step down the mountain, go into life and whatever is facing you today and this week to love him and to live for his glory. So this week, here's my challenge for you. I want you to think even now about that thing that you're concerned about, you're most anxious about right now. I've said it before, the thing you worry about the most is where you trust God the least. And I want you to think about that. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray every day, starting today, for five minutes every day about that. Even even look in the word and say, what can I find out more about this? How could you speak to me, Lord? And here's here's the challenge. I want you to do that every day for five minutes. And then on Friday, I want you to see if your perspective has not changed. I promise you it will. Because you turn to the one who gives perspective. Glory be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word today and we praise you for how you've spoken to us. You're so good to us to give us a picture of where all of history is heading. You've told us that you are even now changing us from glory to ever increasing glory as you are working in our hearts from the inside out. So we give you our lives, Lord. And for those who've not received your grace, or even now, may they do so to say yes to you. Say, I believe. The law and the prophets, everything points to Jesus, who is our Savior. Give him your life today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.